What do you get when you have a sleepy little town that boasts some of the greatest shipbuilding in Canadian history? A town that's, some would say, 10 miles from nowhere. And one of the most famous American singers, if not world famous American singers from the early 1920s, who secretly used to visit this town. And oh yeah, it's a port. God, I love Niagara. I have a question for you. What do you know about Niagara? It has a really big fault. I have a question for you. Do you like history? So let me ask you, is that a rhetorical question? Niagara, it's more than just the falls. It's rich in history and wine. Okay, so we were talking about the more obscure places in Niagara. Some of the coolest history is not even in Niagara Falls. It's Niagara What else do you have to say for yourself? Good morning, I'm Donald and I'm all about history. And I'm all about the base. The base. If you're born, raised, or visit Niagara, you're always from Niagara. One of the greatest places on earth. Hi there, I am standing, and it seems quite obvious, on this very rainy day, in one of Canada's most famous port towns. It's not Port Elgin, it's not Port Coburn, and for all of you General Hospital fans, it is not Port Charles. Hey, it's not in Canada to begin with, and I was also a Luke and Laura fan back in the 80s. I am standing in Port Robinson, Canada, which is just on the outskirts of Niagara. And as the folks here say, kind of in the middle of nowhere. In this episode, you are going to learn about this sleepy little town that boasts some of the coolest history in the Niagara region and all of Canada. And later in the show, I've got some of Canada's most famous favorite musicians as they are going to pose you a great musical trivia question. Check it out. See, Port Robinson was the economic center of the development of the peninsula in the 1850s and 60s. Because it was the halfway point in the journey from the canal starting in Port Lucy to Buffalo, it became a very important center. What happened here, uh, we had all of the trade and commerce coming through Port Robinson. And actually in Port Robinson itself at that time, we had four large hotels, we had two small hotels, and a number of restaurants and areas to eat, hotels actually. And it was because of the influx of visitors and folks coming in on a daily basis and staying overnight. William Hamilton Merritt, on the very first journey through the canal actually, stayed here in Port Robinson. The ship traveled from Port Dalhousie, came up and walked into Lock 38 and 39, and they spent the night here in Port Robinson before continuing the journey the next day to Buffalo. The, uh, we had various stagecoaches coming here from Hamilton, St. Catharines, Port Colburn, Fort Erie. This is a central location for the distribution of mail. Also, it was a very, uh, really a, an excellent area for shipbuilding because of the location, and so we had economic growth here in Port Robinson. There's a story that Dilly Coleman had a very large hotel here in Port Robinson, and he was offered, as he said, a muddy lot in Buffalo in exchange for the hotel that he owned. And he said, not in a million years, the hotel in Port Robinson is worth far more than what I could ever do in Buffalo. And so he decided to stay. And that's just an example of why Port Robinson was really so important in the early days. 1840s, 1850s, in around the 1880s and 1890s, the importance of Port Robinson declined as the shipbuilding declined. And the shipbuilding declined because we were changing over from wood ships to metal hulls. And therefore, there was a less demand for the product that was made in Port Robinson. And gradually, the shipbuilders that were here moved, either passed on or moved away.
The people of Niagara are proud of their heritage, and we as Niagarans reflect on those who came before us to ensure the future of the area. Myself, as a military documentary producer specializing in Canada's military history, feels particularly blessed living in the area that is so rich in military history. Port Robinson is surrounded by that history. What I have here, this is actual documentation and an actual example of the methods of documentation of a ship. Now think of it, ship is built in Port Robinson and it has to be registered in St. Catharines. So you can't physically take this ship to St. Catharines to show it to the folks at Canada Customs. However, you can take documentation and this is a document, an original document from 1884. Albert White is the shipbuilder. The ship was actually built in Wellman, but Albert White lived here in Port Robinson, and he built ships along the canal, Thorold, Port Robinson, Wellman, wherever the work, wherever he could get the work. So we have the original document here, the customs document, and in addition to that, which is quite rare actually, I have a half hull in my hand, and the half hull is, was taken with uh, the documentation to St. Catharines to in fact show what the ship was like. Now we know this half hull is the actual one because on the back side we have the Canada Customs stamp, the signature, and also the name of the ship. And if you look at the writing on the Canada Customs document and the writing on the declaration for approval, they are exactly the same. Now the other thing I have, which is quite interesting, I'm going to put this down, and now we have a picture here of the actual vessel. This again, this vessel was built in 1884, and it was a tug that plied the Welland Canal. It would move the larger vessels through the canal and through the locks. When I think about Allenburg and Port Robinson, uh, a couple of things come to mind. And coincidentally, a friend of mine posted a little story about his visit to a marsh. And when he was 12 years old, his father took him to a marsh and it made a big impression on him. And his father has since died, but the memories have never left him. And they made such an impact that he is going to take his son, when he turns 12, to a marsh. And why does that uh, uh, ring important at this point? Because we're here to talk about Allenburg. And when I was 12 years old, I had heard about the Allenburg Marsh. And uh, it was something that was beyond my imagination. Growing up in Niagara Falls, there were no marshes, but my grandfather and my uncles hunted there. So I couldn't wait to go to see Allenburg. And one morning, on our way to uh, Wellenborg, we were hunting grouse and woodcock. The wee hours of the morning, probably around four or five, we went down this lonely mud road and we walked out into the marsh totally unprepared. We had no waders, we had no rubber boots, and we were going to hunt ducks, and which was kind of a laugh when I think about it. But I was intoxicated by the smell and the uh, the idea that I was in a marsh and the Sun came up and I looked around and I was uh, in awe and what is important to me about the Allenberg experience the Allenberg marsh it was a time when I recorded some of my first the first time I saw a duck in the wild the first time I saw a coot a rail a snipe uh, very important to a young boy uh, starting out in life, and I was becoming a birder without knowing it. And uh, I remember the words of Leonardo da Vinci when he talked about art in science, science in art, and all things being connected. And what connects all of us is the stories that we have and the uh, stories that we share. And to me, that gives us a sense of community, the shared values and shared stories. Charles Richards is, is very interesting in Port Robinson history. Him and his wife actually came to Port Robinson and they purchased a hotel. They were, they were actually innkeepers here in Port Robinson. And one of the quirks of the time, and this was in the early 1850s, if you wanted to get a liquor license to run a hotel, you also had to be the constable. Well, he was the youngest of the four hotel owners, so he was constricted to be the constable. In 1854, in October of 1854 actually, 
there was a robbery in, in uh, out of town, and the Townsend gang were, were actually it turned out to be the Townsend gang that contributed, and they were the ones that uh, uh, were involved with this robbery. Well, they came to Port Robinson later in the day, and they stopped at a hotel, which was directly across the road from Charles Richards' hotel, for something to eat. It was reported, of course, to Charles Richards that the Townsend gang was there. So the word had filtered down to Port Robinson about the uh, robbery earlier in the day. Charles Richard, unarmed, went across the road, went into the hotel, and he approached the gangster Townsend and said to him in a clear, calm voice, come with me, you're under arrest. Townsend was said to reply, take your hand off me or I will shoot you. The constable repeated that two more times, and then Townsend stood up, pulled out his pistol, and shot the constable in the head. That was sad, sad story in its own. But later on, uh, in 2014, the Niagara Regional Police uh, held a, a lovely ceremony here in Port Robinson at the grave site. They honored uh, Charles Richards for his actions. And that day, we had a motorcade of psych motorcycles, police officers, who left Port Robinson and made the journey to Ottawa. In behind the parliament buildings, there's a large uh, statue where all of the officers who were killed in the line of duty in Ontario, their names are engraved in this, uh, on this monument. Well, they went there for the unveiling because in, in 2014, Charles Richards' name was actually added to this particular monument. So there he is, another individual from Port Robinson who is now known nationally uh, and, and did something very significant uh, for the province of Ontario. It was not Ontario at that point, it was still Canada West, but it's now Ontario. We are standing here today in Port Robinson in front of the community center. The community center actually was the second school built here in Port Robinson in 1863. Over to my right, it's a vacant lot at the present time, but this was the location of the very first school. Now this school operated as a school from 1863 up until about 1920 when we moved ahead and built a new school here in Port Robinson. It has now been converted to a community center. The interesting thing about this particular location is we are in the heart of what was downtown Port Robinson, the heart of the community, and when the kids went to school here, they had a unique way of identifying themselves. Uh, I'm going to point to the bricks here, and on the bricks there's many individual names of the early residents of Port Robinson. In fact, there are some dates here going back to 1875, 1876, and we look at the early family names in Port Robinson, and you find many of these same names here on the bricks on my right-hand side. The school itself uh, was very important to the community. As it is today, it's been converted today to a community center. We have many uses today here in Port Robinson. It's used for various activities uh, relating to the kids and the different adult uh, groups here in Port Robinson. And it's an example, of, a wonderful example of architecture from the 1860s. We're here in another location in Port Robinson in front of this example of a Georgian home built in the mid-1860s. The home was the early home of the Coulter family, but most folks that live in Port Robinson in the last number of years would know it as the Goldspink House. It is a wonderful, wonderful example, as I said, of Georgian architecture, but also it's very interesting. It's a second home on the foundation as the earlier home burnt down. And if you go into the basement, you can look at the, the beams and you can still see the burn marks on the beams that are in the house currently. The community of Port Robinson has been around since the early 1800s. Uh, it was a very large shipbuilding community, I think the largest along this area here, larger than well under St. Catharines, hard to believe. Uh, and uh, so we've been around a long time here and uh, we enjoyed for many years uh, being joined by a bridge and we're able to have uh, uh, a good community from west to east here. But in 1974, on a warm, sunny Sunday afternoon, I believe in August 25th, uh, a, a freighter called the Steelton was coming this way and connected to the bridge that was actually right here in this spot here between, uh, you probably can't see it from here, but from here to there, and uh, turned it into a turned it into a, a, a pretzely mess that day and changed our lives forever here. Uh, from that point on, the West and East were separated and uh, the only way we can resolve that issue is, is to find some kind of boat service that would help us to go across. And at the beginning we had uh, local people helping us 
uh, with row boats getting us back and forth just to keep the flow going. We had uh, most of our community uh, activities were on the on, on the east side. Uh, the, you know, I guess the, the, the banks and and, uh, and stores and whatnot would be back there. So, and then we had high school a uh, high school on this side where children on this side had to go to. So, uh, for us to be able to uh, maintain that, we had the small bridge service. So then, uh, down the road, with the help of CUA authority and, and and the locals here, we had. Uh, Bridget come along here, and the name Bridget was a was a name that was agreed upon by the locals here. Uh, kind of a cute little short name that works really good for us. And from there, we've been able to form the community as one again. So it uh, it helped us a whole lot along the way. I'm down at the Port Robinson ferry dock. This is our western terminal in Port Robinson West. The ferry is Bridget. That's behind me. Bridget spends its day moored here and services both sides of the canal. Um, Bridget is a, has been in the water for a long time. It's a joint project between the Seaway and the city of Thorold, and it takes passengers and bicycles back and forth across the canal. It's the only private boat on the whole St. Lawrence Seaway that carries passengers back and forth. Several years ago, the funding was a little bit in danger for the ferry and we formed a committee and we tried to strengthen the ridership which i think we've had some great success with um, the point of the ferry was to get new riders new interests new bicyclists coming across we formed our committee and our job was to try to get the interest up on the on the ferry use to try to get riders to access the boat and use it as part of the the greater niagara circle route what's wonderful about Port Robinson is now it's been incorporated into the bigger route. The Greater Niagara Circle route is almost 200 kilometers long. It goes from Niagara-on-the-Lake to Fort Erie. The Port Robinson dock is halfway, so the riders that are not up to doing the great lengths from one end to the other, they can come down to our area, ride the ferry over and ride back to Niagara-on-the-Lake, or they can come down and ride the ferry over and go back toward Fort Erie and it's called the Great Eight now. It's been redesignated. And the ferry is a huge part of what makes that work. The bicycle riders absolutely love it and they support us completely whenever we need, uh, when we need to talk to the politicians at hand about keeping the funding going, they're right behind us all the way. Between 1866 and 1871, Canada faced the Fenian raids conducted by the Fenian Brotherhood. Uh, an Irish uh, Republican organization. Uh, and they were based out of the United States. Uh, the attackers were attacking British Army forts, uh, custom houses, and any other worthy target in Canada that they could uh, think of. They wanted to uh, bring pressure on the United Kingdom to withdraw from Ireland. One such uh, encounter was uh, at the Battle of Ridgeway, which was some 30 kilometers southeast of uh, Port Robinson. And that was on the 2nd of June in 1866. Some of the locals from Port Robinson supporting the British actually fought at that battle. Dr. King uh, lived in Port Robinson he was a medical doctor, but he also liked his military history. And one of the things that he did, he had money. And he was able to sponsor the Welland Canal Field Battery and have them located here in Port Robinson. And they were here. And it was, you know, it was just a regular routine thing that they would have military actions and military uh, performances here. But it was really to guard the canal. The significant thing is that in June of 1866, we had the Fenian Raids. The Welland Canal Field Battery was called up. They were moved to Port Coburn uh, and then boarded the ship Rob and traveled down to Buffalo. They took up position, or sorry, down to Fort Erie. They took up position in Fort Erie and the Fenian Raids actually, there was a skirmish in Ridgeway and it was a considerable, it was a very large skirmish actually. And the Fenians were then retreating back to Buffalo. And as they approached Fort Erie, Dr. King and the Welland Canal Field Battery engaged the, the ret retreating Fenians. Dr. King 
was wounded. He, he lost his lower leg. He was removed to Buffalo after he was captured. His leg was amputated, came back to Fort Erie, and a few days, days later, he returned to Port Robson, and he was welcomed at the uh, walk that is still visible today, a hero's welcome for what he did and, and what he contributed to uh, Ontario. Now, in looking back in hindsight, this was 10 months before Confederation, and many people today consider this to be the first battle uh, that was fought in Ontario. And, and, and it really was, it was 10, minutes, 10 months before Confederation, but it's considered to be a very significant uh, battle and it helped shape Confederation. In 1974, when the Port Robinson Bridge collapsed, there was another big story emerging. In fact, it was a chap by the name of Mike Smarek, S-M-R-E-K. He became a seven foot, 250 pound basketball player, the first Canadian to win an NBA title. In fact, he won two with the Los Angeles Lakers in 1987, 1988, playing behind Hall of Famer Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at center, also played with Magic Johnson. I knew Mike Smarek indirectly in that in the 1970s, I was a high school basketball scout. I had my own little company, Canadian Scouting Report, and I scouted the top high school players in Canada for about 30 colleges and universities in the United States and Canada and the Canadian national team. Mike Smarek went on to Eastdale High School in Welland and then to Canisius College in Buffalo where he I think still holds some records for block shots and field goal percentage. Around the same time we had a couple of other high profile Canadian basketball players in the area. One I coached uh, an all-star team by the name of Jay Triano who went on to become the national men's head coach for Canada and also for two years coached in the NBA with the Toronto Raptors. Another Welland area athlete was Tom Skurlak, another great basketball player. He went on to play for Simon Fraser University. Anyway, Mike Smarek played for three other NBA teams besides the Lakers. He played in Europe. He played, uh, actually he almost played for the Toronto Raptors. I covered the Raptors for the Toronto Star in 1995-96. And Smarek was one of the last cuts on the uh, Raptors in the uh, preseason. So he went on to become a teacher eventually in Niagara Falls and he's now on the Welland Sports Wall of Fame and this year 2019 he was elected to the Canadian Basketball Hall of Fame and uh, as a side note I made a couple of years ago the Canadian Senior Men's Basketball Wall of Fame as a builder so uh, Thank you, Mike Smrek, for uh, dragging me along. Hi, I'm Gordon Depp. And I'm Sandy Horn, and we're from the Canadian band The Spoons. Now, we've been around for almost 40 years, so we 40? know... Yeah, 40 years, so we know a thing or two about music. Now, here's a trivia question. What mid-1900s crooner secretly came to Port Robinson? Number one, Frank Sinatra. Number two, Bing Crosby. Number three, Sammy Davis Jr. Not to be confused with Sammy Hagar. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the answer is Bing Crosby. And let me tell you why. Bing Crosby, in his younger years, before he became really famous, he was a performer in Buffalo. And Miss Stark, who lived here in Port Robinson, she remained Miss Stark all her life. Uh, she would travel to Buffalo on occasion, and that's how they met. Bing Crosby was just fell in love with her, and he made numerous trips here to Port Robinson to court her. He would travel from Buffalo by train to Port Robinson, get off at the local train station, walk down the street, walk by my mom's house, and then go to see Miss Stark. And of course, Miss Stark was always very pleasant, very courteous, but she rejected all his overtures. And Bing later went back to Buffalo, went back to his life in California. Miss Stark stayed in Port Robinson, lived here her entire life. Bridget Arboda has been able to uh, help uh, the residents from the west side come over to the east side and vice versa. Uh, most of the uh, commerce in this area is, is over on the east side. 
we have a post office there, we have a bar, an ice cream area, and we also have a water pad in the uh, park. Uh, we also have wheelchair accessibility here, so just about anybody can go across at any time when, when we, uh, we have that opportunity. Here we are on Bridget. You're seeing a different angle of Port Robinson than you would any other way. As you can see, both the east and west sides here uh, at the beautiful canal. Uh, in, my, in the past Canterbury, you'll see that in the far, in the far horizon there is the Ellenberg Bridge, which is about five miles away. That's the nearest bridge from here. And then from there, you go into Welland, uh, and all the bridges there are closed. And the new, the new thoroughway there will take you into Port Homer. So this is one of the only ways you can cross in this area. Port Robinson Proud uh, has a motto and their motto is, is we're 10 minutes from everywhere in the middle of nowhere. It's five o'clock somewhere? What's that mean? What I know about Port Robinson isn't too much. Most of the history I study is here in Niagara Falls, and God knows there's more than enough for me. Uh, Port Robinson, let's see. Um, all I really remember is the uh, boat hitting the bridge. And you know, Port Robinson was a bit of a little thriving community at the time, and I never understood why the region or the Seaway Authority or who was responsible never got together to rebuild the bridge. I mean, what would happen if Chippewa lost their bridge? They'd have it rebuilt in a New York minute. Why not Port Robinson? As we leave you today from Port Robinson, I'd like to leave a message with you. And I'd like you to think about not only the history of Port Robinson, which is on display and we're so proud to show it to you, but also some of the other activities and things that you can find here. And, and one of the areas of interest that the young kids especially like is traveling across the canal on the ferry. The ferry will take you back and forth across the canal. You can then come over to the, to the east side of the canal go into the pub, enjoy an ice cream, have a cold drink, and go into the park, and if you would like, go into the splash pad. We just have so much to offer here, and we think we would like to invite all the residents of the peninsula to come into Port Robinson and, and share what we have. Uh, we feel kind of uh, privileged and, and it's a pleasure to live here, and we would like to share that with the residents of the area, and also outsiders that might come from far afield. But you're all welcome, and we will do our very best to make you welcome here in Port Robinson. And that concludes our show. Thank you for checking us out and visiting Port Robinson, albeit vicariously through these wonderful historians and yours truly. If you ever have the chance to visit Port Robinson, I highly recommend it. The people are extremely hospitable, personable, and very endearing. And they got pretty good ice cream and awesome ferry rides. See you next time on Historical Niagara. Yeah.